The Inconvenient Truth, Final Cut Pro 10. I'm Evan Sheckman, uh, CTO of Radical Media. Radical Media is a big transmedia company. We make bunches, bunches and bunches of stuff. But more relevant, I guess, to a group like this is I was a founder of a company called Outpost Digital, a company that was started over 10 years ago out of my apartment. That's the flyer I used to hand out on Final Cut Pro 1.0 when computers looked like jello molds. Um, so I've been doing this a long time, so why the hell am I standing at TechServe uh, to talk about a product that seemingly the entire blogosphere thinks is uh, for skateboarders? We're going to give you a bit of an overview of what's going on in Final Cut Pro 10. We're going to talk directly to the perceived misconceptions and the things that are actually missing and go over for people who are editors who's used Final Cut 7. All right, so good, most of us. All right, so we're going to go over like, hey, Where'd they move my stuff, or what is it called, or how we do workflow? It's not really Final Cut Pro training, because we don't have that much time to go over all of that. But before we dive directly into it, I want to just contextualize what the hell is going on. So firstly, everyone in this room who edits for a living is in a creative business. And it's just that, it's a business. The fact of the matter is, uh, is that if this isn't the right tool for the right job in 12 months, we're going to use something else. However, I do not believe that it is nearly the more you know. I don't think it's nearly as dire as anyone has made it out to be, right? So one thing in this business and in technology in general is change is constant. So anyone who fears change like Garth Algar needs to go someplace else, go to another business. Everything changes. You can rely on that. This is Final Cut Pro 7. It is the place on your couch where your butt fits exactly perfectly because you've been sitting in it for 10 years. You know, the perceived deficiencies of the original Final Cut Pro became the workflow that most of you made up to get around the things that were never put into Final Cut Pro, even in 10 years of uh, development. Post-production software, uh, editing software in specific, it lives in an ecosystem that is much greater than the interface that a lot of you make your money in and spend your time in all day long. And really to understand what the hell is going on and why seemingly everything has been turned on its head, it's a reaction to a larger situation. Let's go back to the beginning. 1998, just before Final Cut Pro, DV Revolution, the VX1000, who remembers this camera? Silver camera, 32 kilohertz audio, that's right. Start of a revolution, plastic lens and a motor so loud, the mic picked it up. And then of course the Jello Mold G3 ships, the first computer with the Firewire port. Uh, the average hard drive size is, was no larger than 37.5 gigs. No larger. This, in fact, came out, I think, right around 99. I'm putting things in context. That was the largest hard drive, serial ATA, that you can get. And we were editing on Targa DV2000 RTX cards. I was told that real time ships this summer in 1998, and it never did until the day I threw it into the garbage. Final Cut Pro 1 is released. I was working on a stolen beta of it before then, and it was a very big deal for the little Outpost Digital that we had. We were doing Premiere, we were doing visual effects and after effects. To be a professional facility, professional facility even then, this was an alternative. And no one would touch it with a 10-foot pole back then. And it was a toy, and Apple was going out of business. Uh, but for me, this was kind of the savior of my business. It, it differentiated what it is that we were doing. And it had a great feature set that's been built on to this day. Then the Cinewave card came. Many, I don't even know if anyone even remembers that. Cinewave card was the first time we really had real-time video, full res, on the Mac, relatively low cost. By the way, what qualifies me to talk about this is, and I will definitely stand here and toot my own horn because I'm on a soapbox and in a window, uh, is that we've done some of the largest work very, very early on Final Cut Pro, and I got the crap beat out of me for doing it that way. You know, on Cinewave, we did the film Jay-Z, Fade to Black, which had wide, national theater release. The Cinewave card used to get so hot, we had one in the fridge and one in the computer. When we dropped frames, we swapped them. I swear to God. <laughs> Transition is not new to anybody in this room who's a Mac user. We've been through this before. OS 10, we're going to talk about it briefly, was a complete change from OS 9, which was really the, the butt print in the couch. Final Cut Pro 2 ships, we have Matrix RT Mac, which was well, that was a foul product. Real-time editing, <laughs> DVD Studio Pro finally ships. Final Cut Pro 3, real-time color corrector. Everyone loves a three-way. Uh, offline RT, and it's the first Final Cut Pro to operate on Mac OS X. DVC Pro HD only came out in 2002. This wasn't even the beginning of solid state, per se, but in a year or two after this, we were working on solid state. 
DVC Pro HD, by the way, was the first time an acquisition codec from a camera was put inside of a computer, other than DV. This was a pretty big deal when it actually shipped. It's a bit old news now. Ah, the work of the devil, HDV. The foreign exchange student of the video world. Long op MPEG-2, right? We're all fickle users of it, to the point where, a big deal, I can cut anywhere and I can, I can fast forward and rewind. We, that's, that's our expectation. So Lumiere, why is Lumiere on the list? Well, this was a bridge piece of software before Final Cut Pro genuinely supported HDV in the way that it did, or the Apple Intermediate codec, which was short-lived, or led to ProRes. But this is a bigger deal. And where's Matt from TechServe? So who wrote Lumiere? And Frederick introduced himself to a guy named Jim Jannard, Jim Jannard who I believe owned Oakley. Yes. This, is a, this is a pretty pivotal moment in 2003. That meeting of those two people and Jim asking, why does video suck and my SLR shoot good pictures? We'll come back to in just a minute. Final Cut Pro 4, 32-bit, woo, XML interchange. Rip XML, right? And then, of course, studio shipping, Final Cut Pro HD. This was the big push of everything over Firewire, broadcast quality HD export over single Firewire cable, digital cinema desktop monitoring, Apple cinema display. It was a good product. XSAN, which big facilities use for shared storage. It was a very big deal. We were a beta tester. We're at 120 gig drives. Final Cut Pro 5, native HDV, multi-camera. It took to version 5 to have multi-camera in the first place. Final Cut Studio was released. The transition to Intel, which was a very positive and simple transition to make, but we've been through this before. The HVX 1000 was the, really the beginning of shooting in solid state. That only came in 2006. Only. I have a skewed sense of time. ProRes. ProRes was a reaction to the fact that cameras were shooting MPEG and H.264 and God knows what. And so everything, this was a mezzanine codec. Everything goes to ProRes, everything will be just fine. ProRes was an extremely important step for Apple. The Canon 5 Mark, 5D Mark II was a huge change agent in many ways. It shot non-optimized codecs. The business has been shooting on DV for film, and they're shooting on DSLRs for TV and film. It was a change agent. The point of me even showing that, and then even a 4K camera, is that these are major moments that happened separate of the editing interface, where now the editing interface has to react to it. And Final Cut Pro 7 was not a reaction to any one of these things. It created more work for assistance. You got a transcode, debayer. You have a lot of work to do, and it has to turn you into an IT staff. Final Cut Pro 7, which we're still on, more ProRes codecs. Today, the largest hard drive we can buy in a single chassis is three terabytes. In under 10 years, it's a, it's a hundred fold increase in storage. It becomes important in a minute. Let's get a little bit techy for a second. This isn't the best example, but the fact of the matter is with 10.7, we don't really run on the QuickTime media layer anymore, the QTML, which is what is currently going on. We're gonna run on something called AV Foundation. Why is there no third party video out in Final Cut Pro? Because the operating system hasn't shipped. Because when it does, every card manufacturer will need to rewrite their drivers anyway. We'll agree that Apple's silence can be taken as arrogance. And we can also agree that they're a huge company that makes the operating system, which is the principal benefit to running software made by a hardware company. But the fact of the matter is they're out of lockstep. They should have shipped 10.7 first and gotten the drivers written, then shipped Final Cut 10. Why they didn't do that? At every step in the change in the video business, there's been a reaction in the editing software. And we've been reactive for 10 years, but there's a couple of fundamental things that have changed to the point where it's time for a rethink. Right, so just quickly, OS 9, does everyone remember this thing? It was fantastic. We knew how to shift boot, right? And move out extensions, and there were Easter eggs. And this, was, oh, this is 10.0. So powerful, it can load OS 9 inside of it, but couldn't play DVDs. Uh, we've been here. Everyone, for, your body forgets pain. So we all forgot the fact that we've been through this before. You couldn't load Final Cut Pro on this, but the fact of the matter is, and Apple was small enough at the time to have the balls to say, it's time to reboot. We've got to change the rules. We've got to start over. Well, that's where we started, and this is going to ship next week. If it wasn't for the starting over, we could not be here. 
everyone will agree that Mac OS X and its underpinnings, which are now being exploited across a number of platforms, is revolutionary. So sometimes you've got to cut the cord. I'm not saying it's fun. As I'm just trying to illustrate a pattern with the people at Apple, good or bad. Cut, copy, paste on an iPhone. No. No. Yes. Two years and 18 days to give us cut, copy, and paste on the iOS platform. We're not going to sit here and debate that arguably iOS is the most advanced mobile operating system, right? It's pervasive. With no cut, copy, paste in two years and 18 days. If Apple waits two years and 18 days to add certain features back to Final Cut Pro, we have a problem. Let's talk about the initial reception. It's been quiet. <laughs> Final Cut 10 is Windows Vista. Uh, I can't believe what Apple did with Final Cut 10. It's no longer a professional application. It's just an upgrade of iMovie. I'm so disappointed I want to cry. Simply put, they're unopenable in Final Cut 10. What the F are you thinking? Macintosh. When have you called it Macintosh? I don't understand. <laughs> Fire your project manager. Thank you, poets. Like many of you out there, I was excited since seeing it in Vegas. I downloaded it this morning, foolishly, of course. To my surprise, it's not backwards compatible. Fail. Thank you, Matt Voss from wherever. It's not all bad, right? Here's a guy who's a professional editor. He went home. Um, he thinks it's going to be great. Thanks, dude. Uh, he spent more than 24 hours working with it, and it's going to be great. He takes back the bad words that he said. So where are we now? Cameras shoot non-optimized codecs. Almost all video is now solid state. All machines that we buy are multi-core. A lot of us work off of centralized storage off or off of network volumes. Final Cut 10 officially supports network mounted volumes. It's a pretty big deal. It's going to run on 10.7 and leverage a lot of its core features. So a lot of what people think is missing will be supplanted or supplemented, pardon me, uh, no, both really, by the operating system. Final Cut 10 is we're going to go over some new media management. We're going to go over new import workflow. Why do they do that to the timeline? It's elegant and fantastic. We're going to talk about what auto analysis is show the truth in background rendering in this version, talk about 64-bit, and a bunch of these other things we're going to go over instead of looking at them. And let's just do this real quick. Here's what people think it lacks, multi-camera, OMF, EDL, XML, backwards compatibility. Here's what it actually lacks, which is um, it's missing OMF. When's the last time anyone exported an EDL? Yeah? You have a floppy drive you maintain? I mean, seriously, it's what we're talking about here. So, okay, so just take that, so just take that off the list, uh, and right now if you want to. So it's missing multi-camera XML, and some semblance of backwards compatibility. We'll come back to that in a bit. Now, so let's get out of Keynote. Let's look at the actual program. It's what we came here to do. All right, look, it looks like iMovie out of the box, but I promise you that after using it for a short period of time, <laughs> it is not. All right, so I'm going to do one thing that I like to do, shortcut utilities. I like to bring up Activity Monitor. It'll be in the way a little bit, but it's actually going to help prove a point. Why am I bringing up the Activity Monitor? Uh, it's been a damn shame that up until recently when you used an Apple product on their own machines and you went to do something processor intensive, most of your cores sat like a hamster wheel. You know, they, didn't, they did nothing. I'm leaving this up so you can see that when we go and start to hit the processor, this thing peaks right off the scale. I mean, it really, so if you've got a machine and we've been testing it down to uh, uh, a dual-core dual iMac, one of the first aluminums. And I've got to be honest with you, I cannot believe how fast it is. We're going to go over that. So we're actually going to start all the way at the beginning. I just can't also understand, now let me zoom in here a little bit, I cannot understand how people got upset that there were less preferences, right? I've heard the weirdest things. There's, I, where's my eight pages of preferences? I don't, I don't know, where's your eight pages of preferences? Why do you need eight pages of buttons? The toggle. I'm serious. And then, ah, it's not professional. It's too easy. <laughs> no, it should be a total pain in the ass to use. I mean, it's like, I get it. I get some of it. What we're going to really start with is import workflow because it's quite different. Firstly, there is tape transport control inside of the program. It's meant for anything that travels over a firewire cable. It's not good enough for most people. Most people who are dealing with tape have some kind of third-party card, Decklink or Kona. Both of those cards come with their own tape transport software. I'm not saying it's the best thing I've ever seen, but for the fact of the matter is, for that kind of that layback, I don't think it should be Apple's responsibility. They'll never do it as well as a hardware manufacturer is going to do for their own piece of hardware. So starting here with organizing, copy files into the Final Cut Events folder. For people who work on shared storage, 
you will not copy files into the Final Cut Events folder. Just turn it off. So the first myth is that it doesn't work with shared storage. It works just fine with shared storage. Like the current shared storage model, you're not going to leave your project file on the shared storage. That goes local. But it doesn't matter if it's XSAN or a good gigabit connected um, hard drive stack or whatever other makeshift thing that I've seen people do with hot glue and staples. Copy files into Final Cut Events folder. You do not do it. References the media. Import folders is keyword collections. Should you have made folder organization at the desktop level, with, which almost no one does, um, if you have folder names, they get imported as keywords. We're going to talk about keywording. It's awfully, awfully important. Here's where the cool stuff comes in. Create optimized media or proxy media. This is an unbelievably fast computer. This is a 12 core, shows up as 24 cores because of hyper threading. So what is optimized media? Here's the amazing thing, right? You shoot 5D Mark II or anything that's a non-standard, non-ProRes codec. And on a decent machine, including a two-core iMac, you drop that stuff directly into the program and you immediately start editing. No render. Try that in Final Cut 7, right? It's a no-no. It's a no-go from the boot. That's a major rewrite to all of a sudden take non-optimized codecs, not only edit with them in real time immediately, with no render, no render, color correct them, add effects, graphics, and even output. And the rendered output is no difference in quality than the live playing output at all, zero difference. If you're on a machine that is marginal in speed and you're having an issue and you check create optimized media, if I bring in non-optimized media, if I bring in XD Cam EX, sure I can edit with it natively. And it's, yeah, it's a little bit better than the nightmare that it currently is in FCP7. But if I want to create optimized media, automatically, every time I idle up and the mouse goes idle for a user-specified period of time, it starts to transcode properly frame size, frame rate, scan, and scan type in the background. So you just idle and go to lunch and you come back, it's already done the transcoding to the optimized media format. So what does it look like in the Finder? Well, we used to have in the Finder render files, right? Waveform files, thumbnail cache. If in the case where you're using create optimized media, there's original media folder, there's an optimized media folder. If I'm going to be taking work home with me all the time, I'm going to say create proxy media. You can also specify which ProRes codec is your proxy. So when I want to pick up and go using the media manager, I can just move the proxy media and connect it back to the project. This was an assistant editor step. It's done automatically by the program. I don't know, I'm pretty impressed by that. Analyze for stabilization of rolling shutter, another non-destructive thing. Analyze for balanced color, not color correction, and it's non-destructive. If I've taken a bunch of stuff in from the same reel, right, based on time code, it's going to pre-analyze so that the white point is completely balanced between shots before I even apply color correction. You can turn it off, and you don't have to do it. Find people is just proof that Apple has alien technology they've been releasing very slowly. Um, <laughs> So it's going to scan through. It's going to automatically make smart collections that say one shot, two shot, wide shot, shaky, group shot. It's spooky. It actually works. It's, it works on stills just the same. Create smart collections after analyzation. I'll show you. Same thing for audio. Analyze and fix. Separate mono and group stereo and remove silent channels. In our environment, how many clips I get that are eight channels of audio with six silent channels. Just get rid of it. Get rid of it. The import workflow is supposed to do some of the work for you. The background rendering is a pretty big deal. Uh, and here we can specify that after x seconds of being idle, I wonder if I can do this, go to the decimal. Ah, nice, you can. That's like shaving a frame off of an edit. That's nice. So you can specify the time in which you are idle that the background tasks will automatically start. People, I don't want it the background render. I'm on a laptop. Then turn it off. And then you have, to, you have to render it. The fact of the matter is, uh, it's very self. I've never been forced to render, even on a MacBook Air. On playback, I can tell to use the proxy media. So if I've got footage that is not playable on my machine, Final Cut automatically made the proxy media. My machine that's not powerful, I tell it to switch, use the proxy media instead of using original or optimized media. Right, playback quality, we're going to go for higher quality just to show what it can do. Another massive paradigm shift, the project file is separate from your media. They, there's no media in the project file anymore. There's media in the organizer window, top left, events library, 
I'm going to show you how it ends up working. Let's look at uh, clips from the album. And I'm going to just change the screen proportions. Again, if we had two monitors, it would work exactly the same that you're used to. So let's take a look at the organizer window. I'm gonna, first, I'm going to customize it to make it look a bit more usable, all right? I should say that also, we're going to jump around because I don't demo it all that often, although we know how to use it intimately. There is no viewer in Canvas window. Anyone who had a Media 100 remembers this. There is only one window. The playhead and this thing called the skimmer. <coughs> I'm going to turn off the audio scrub for a second. The, the, the skimmer, wherever I touch, I got this live feeling, right? I'm here I am in the timeline, I'm scrubbing. Here I am in the organizer window and I'm scrubbing. The skimmer and the playhead are two separate objects. Imagine that this skimmer is the viewer window, right? When we hit play, where the playhead is rolls. Pause it, wherever the skimmer is, it's completely live. Well, this is big and chunky and feels like Legos. So what do we do? So first of all, I'm going to shut off the waveforms in here, right? We saved a bit of screen real estate. And you have control over how big these guys are, right? With me, good. And then here, of course, we can change the duration that we're viewing. If you've used the current version of iMovie, which this shares no code with, um, this is familiar to you. Their concept here is the following. You don't know what's inside the clip. So let's unfold it to whatever degree you want. That way you can see what it is that you're looking for. This footage was donated by Josh after he made a film called The L Bomb. It's pretty funny. Our editors, they usually use a separate timeline Right? They made selects for the editors, depending on who the editor is. They made these string outs. The fact of the matter is, that's not necessary. The organizer window is the string outs. I'm just jumping between whole cuts. You can scroll down. I don't love this event metaphor. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm going to shut it off. So I'm going to say group events by disk, group by date, range by most recent, group clip by name, real, scene. You can reorganize this, get it out of the whole date metaphor if you want to. In many cases, date metaphor works just fine for a lot of us, especially our shop doing a lot of documentary television, right? There's an alternate view altogether. So I can get this list view, and I can say group them by date, by year, whatever, whatever organization I want, and it works the same way. I can even start to do ins and outs up here just the same, right? So this, to a certain extent, is the other tab timeline that was open. This is the viewer window. So of course here, right clicking still holds true. You can show other columns. You can rearrange your columns. You can even shrink this down to get just a, you don't want to look at all the events of the smart collections. The massive change here is that they really want you using this keyword engine. It's actually pretty powerful. I'm going to show you how it works. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit so hopefully you can see better, right? So here on the left, it's searching the home directory where we copied our stuff. We had a Firewire drive attached. The internal drive is faster, of course. And so these are smart collections that we made. And how's that work? Well, there's a big, huge key, subtle. And I'll open up this keywording interface. Let's take a quick peek inside of it. Now, you can do free word tagging. This changes the game a little bit. If you are the assistant editor, that's, then you need to come up with your own nomenclature for how you're going to tag the media from a specific event. You're going to take a couple of keywords. They let you take 10 currently, attach them to a hotkey. So as you're watching, you're keywording. You can keyword and stack them. I can keyword a clip. I, within that clip, I can mark a range and put 10 keywords on it. The point here is that media can now live in multiple bins simultaneously without you having to duplicate media and screw up your XML by doing so. That's a pretty big deal. But it does that based on keywording. So uh, we're going to put in. I'm really creative today, test. OK, so it's the devil on this shoulder that told me to do it. So the idea would be that if I'm playing along in this clip, scale down a little bit here, right? I'm playing along in this clip. I want to show the left side of the window. You see the word test fly into the clip. It automatically made a bin on the left-hand side here called test. So instead of creating a bin and putting stuff in it, you start tagging things with keywords. If the bin doesn't exist, it gets created, the footage goes inside of it. I'm also going to tag the range of this, and I'll tag that one with just one of the tags. So here, obviously, I got the clips I put in. It opens up to show me the keywording. Obviously, if this was pretty fluid. You're going through the, you're skimming through, and you're hitting hotkeys, and you're adding all these keywords. Does anyone think this is cool? 
No, I, I don't care. It's a different. Uh, I'm just trying to show you. I think it's awesome. I mean, this is an awfully different way of working than we do now. Everything shows up here on the left-hand side, right? So if you just keyworded it, it automatically belongs inside of a bin. This gets really powerful for media management when I go to the search field. Of course, I can do regular Boolean searching, right? If you know how to use Google, you can use this. But if I touch the magnifying glass, you can just start doing some pretty sophisticated searching. I'm going to turn off text. I'm going to add. Text, ratings, media type, stabilization, keywords, people, format info. So let's just say format info. So I'm looking for any frame size that includes 1920. And has the keyword includes any testes. Make a new smart collection. So you can start to do some pretty detailed searches. Anything that is this frame size at this frame rate that's from this date put here. Or this keyword with this name put here, right? When we shoot with multiple cameras that are maybe mixed formats or whatever it is, this is a great way of being able to organize that way. Here, really briefly, I'll show the import window. Uh, if we had Firewire plugged in, you'd see transport controls below. They have this other thing called camera archives, which was actually a good thing borrowed from iMovie, that if you're coming from a solid state system, uh, you can import it and then repackage it as a disk image using Final Cut Pro. Makes it a bit more portable so you can bring it to another system and re-import it as if it was coming from the card yet again. Let's show projects. This is where your projects live. This live nature of Final Cut Pro is pretty awesome that here's a bunch of projects that we left holes in purposely. I don't even need to open them to find out what's in them. Even when you're in an export window and you're looking at a thumbnail, everything is this live scrubbing. Right? So I could scrub in these projects. I'm going to open up the TechServe demo, and there it opens. Here, unlike tabs, which I actually miss, so I can't say that uh, I won't be complaining about it until they add it back, we can tab between open projects. I'll open another one, which we're going to go into later, so I can actually go back and forth between the two. Can't overlap them, can't rip windows apart. I think that's kind of arrogant, right? Like I want my metadata window over here. Not on the other side of my viewer window. <laughs> so the properties for any specific project, by the way, just um, there's a thing called modify event references. So if you have a project that, uh, where media lives in several different events, we have the ability to prioritize which event it's going to look at first for reconnection of media. So I'm going to go back to this TechServe project that we built. I want to show some of the editing mechanics. So first thing that's going to freak everybody out, and this is a problem with muscle memory that you've all made from using Final Cut. Here's a clip, and I delete it. Ripple delete is the default. And if I don't want it to ripple delete, I use the old ripple delete, which leaves the space. It is the polar opposite. Everything the magnetic timeline wants to collapse. You can override it. Everyone keeps getting crazy that they took away all the things that you used to. So if I hold down P, I'm able to move things anywhere I want them, override the magnetic timeline, and leave myself a space. A lot of people do this for the back timing of things and leaving it. I need to have a clip that fits just there. So uh, let's talk about different editing techniques that we've all been used to for a very awfully long time, right? So uh, we're going to grab a clip from up here. I'm not trying to edit anything. I'm just trying to show mechanics. I'm going to take this clip, I'm going to do it the drag and droppy way, where if I drag on top of a clip, I get a menu. Let me zoom in so you can see it in the back. Replace, replace from start, replace from end, replace and add to audition. We're going to show audition or cancel. Drag a clip onto a clip, spawns a menu asking you what you want to do with it. Obviously, re re replace from start, if the clip is not as long as the one that's here, it automatically slides everything back down, right? Swap the clip out of place. Insert and overwrite still exist. I believe I can grab this clip, hit the P, drop it over. There you go. I can overwrite the way that I did, and you can ins insert the way that you did. However, this is where everything begins to change. It's trackless for video. They're going to have to do track assignments for audio, but for right now it's trackless for video. They call that main track that you see there, that's not track one. That's your primary storyline. Now, for a lot of us in here, a lot of, I, and I'm not speaking for everyone, everyone edits differently, different strokes. If we're doing documentary television, I've got some kind of base piece of video that I'm going to be cutting away from, talking head, right, or a, or a room that I'm in. So you're laying down your base track, and they have a new thing, which is append to storyline. So that's taking a clip, and I'm going to, you see this little, little knobby here that will make all of you blind? 
that is where this clip now has a, a pretty loose relationship with the one below it. It is append to storyline. So if we start creating montages or do vertical editing before we had either range selection or just lasso all of it and move it together, the fact of the matter is if you get a nice big base track, you can start appending things to the primary storyline and they move around. The interesting thing is where there would normally be a clip collision here, as you can see, it'll just move itself up a little bit to get out of the way automatically. If I move it back over, it'll go back and use the real estate that it actually deserves. That's append to the storyline. The timeline itself, right? So Shift-Z still works just the same. Now let's talk about how we can customize the look of the timeline. You can do just a little bitty media, right? We've all seen that before. We can do kind of uh, video thumbnail, no, um, no waveform and audio below. Waveforms are for everybody. Uh, audio having more of the priority. And again, I can actually slip it, I can slide this to actually change the size of the, you know, make it bigger for the people in the back. Um, I'm primarily doing audio, and audio is the only thing I'm interested in. Uh, we're probably all going to pretty much leave it in some semblance of this. Uh, and of course, I can, you want to show clip connections. There you go. The other great thing about audio now is that, and you can barely see it in this clip because it's, Josh did a good job, is that, uh, you get a visual cue for how, if you're clipped. And the other thing that has been uh, fixed or adjusted is now right clicking where you would normally do um, is linear S curve plus three or minus three dB, right? So some preset shapes in there. And this remains the same, right? All the rubber banding and all the audio that you're used to is identical, but now we can actually go down to the sample level, which makes a big, huge deal. The other thing is you can see that your primary storyline the stuff that you bring in, audio is married to video. Automatically, audio married to video on the primary storyline here. And the same thing goes for audio on a clip like this. The way that it's set up, you cannot break primary audio through the course of normal editing. It's impossible to do that because the audio is married to this clip. However, what happens with J cuts and L cuts, right? If you double tap on the audio waveform, I can now just go in here and do a J cut and L cut, double click on it again. hey -o and it's supposed to collapse back down. Double click the waveform, I'm able to do one or the other. Okay, so uh, we did J cuts, L cuts, we did a little bit of a pen to main storyline. Uh, I don't want to get out of turn here. Uh, let's talk about some new stuff. Everyone remembers the hellish time vampire that nesting was? In uh, Final Cut 10, it's called compound clip, and it works in, a in several different places. Let me just bring this down to size, compound clips. Compound clips basically do take the place of what nesting used to be. Double clicking a compound clip we already made, we didn't do a lot of vertical editing, we put a bunch of the montage of we're dating, we're dating all together. But if I want to take a bunch of media and treat it like a single clip, I can do it from this window, grab all these guys, right click and say new compound clip. Compound clip's going to ask me, set automatically based on the first video clip. So if I've got mixed formats together, I can say the first one that I highlighted dictates it for the rest. Right, and of course, here's where we set our custom properties. Look, it supports 4K in four different resolutions. Here's the new compound clip. It's got a little icon. You can see right there, right? And it's all the clips together, double clicking it. Obviously, it can open up and I can see all the media. Compound clips is a mechanism to keep the timeline a bit neater than it was before. All this stuff seemingly requires render, right? It's like a good cooking show. Uh, here's Josh's cut, right? Let's watch it quickly. It's really short. Hey. Sorry, I'm late. No, it's fine. <sighs> Nothing stops editing, even yeah. the preference window. That's new. <laughs> It's almost over. Title runs. 
All right, so look, we got a big orange, yay, Josh. Big orange bar across all saying that it does require render. We didn't render a damn thing. We had no problem just there. There's color correction. There's a bunch of other stuff. Let's take a look at this. This is the background task window. This is awesome. So what we're showing here is that there's no transcoding or analysis going on, no import of media, nothing else is going on. It's got some rendering. It's background rendering. I'm still able to edit. As soon as I hit video engine though, it automatically pauses. We set it to 1.1 seconds. There it goes. It starts automatically rendering. We talked about the processor bars. Everyone can see these, right? Why is it every other one? Because those are the only real cores in the machine. The other ones are software based. They're hyper threaded. When has anyone seen Final Cut Pro do that on anything? I think that's a pretty big freaking deal to me. And look at that. The longer it goes, then the more it becomes priority. And there it goes off the scale. Very quickly, again, uh, video scopes, they're better than they've ever been before. You got your waveform, you got your vector scope. The cool thing is their color, their real time, their high res, right? That's pretty nice. They look pretty nice. When you've got more screen real estate, if I were to close off the inspector, again, even touching the interface, nothing stops editing. Zero gets in the way of creative process. Every editor in this room has their way that when a producer or director comes in to stack footage vertically in the timeline and hide clips and solo stuff out, right here, there's a small icon right here. We've made an audition. We picked three or four different pieces of media. We grouped them together like compound clip. I said, make audition. You do it in the timeline. I'll show you how to do it if you really care to see it. And uh, we click on the little, the little uh, light. The fact of the matter is, I know this looks like cover flow, but here's what ends up happening. Here's clip one. It automatically does a play around edit. I'm just going to let it go, right? It'll keep playing around the edit. I haven't touched it. I want to see what this clip looks like. Start over. Other look. Nah, that's not the one we're looking for. Try the third one. Everyone see the top stuff on the right hand side, slipping and sliding as necessary? That's, it automatically loops play until I select one. There it plays out. That's the one that we picked, and off it goes. That's called audition. So I can literally take a bunch of clips in the timeline, if we did stack them vertically and append them to the main storyline, make the audition right there, or just for the sake of our demo, highlight these four, right click one, create audition. The audition acts like a normal clip. You hit the little spotlight, boom, it opens up. You're able to audition those clips. When you double click on an edit point, it automatically opens the precision editor. This is where all editing techniques actually live under one click. Double click, the track split, right? So now I get the dream. I get the tail of this clip, which we used to match frame to go look at in another window, a bunch of buttons. And I can see all of the tail, of the header of this clip, and I can see the tail of this clip. So double clicking an edit point opens up. It gives you, it basically gives you two trim tools, and it also gives you roll. Um, what I didn't, what I, what I set in the preferences was that if I'm going to stay in this single track mode and do some editing, I want the viewer window to split. Kind of like the old trim window that no one ever, well, I never, I never used. I can only speak for myself. No modes, no modifiers. I'm going to the edit point, and I'm literally just clicking and dragging. You can obviously see it denotes which clip is kind of highlighted. So I'm dragging back and forth, right? If I do that inside of a clip, uh, if I select the trim tool, which is T, I'm inside of a clip. I can slip and slide right inside of the container, right? That's pretty, I think it's pretty neat. And then option selecting that, right? So, all the editing tools that we're used to are all there. I think, in my personal opinion, double clicking and grabbing this guy and being able to roll and edit like that and hit return and snap it back down, I don't know, that's, got a, that's a few keystrokes faster. Is anyone impressed by that? Not that I care. Good, though. That's what we're here to do. We're demystifying that it's terrible and it's not for pros. And that's pretty sophisticated. I don't know if that's just for skateboard videos. That's just this guy. We're going to do two things. We're going to do a speed effect and we're going to do a little bit of color correction. OK, first and foremost, pre-analyzed all the footage, right? Here's a beautiful piece of really nicely graded uh, running footage. Here is the track in daytime, right? I want this to look like this. I don't know how to color correct. Click here. I'm going to match color, saying choose. Uh, that's a good keyframe. Click it, apply match, play it. We color corrected H260. Oh, it's stuttering a little bit. There it goes. Speed. Speed is definitely finally in its fourth iteration in something called Final Cut Pro finally works correctly. So first I'll turn on normal, right? So there I got a green bar telling me I'm at normal, I'm at 100%. And I can click on that guy and here's shortcuts for slow, fast, and normal. However, if I start to just automatically drag it down, blue says I'm moving faster than normal, orange means I'm moving slower than normal. Slow is always more difficult than fast, right? 
So here I'm at like a 60, I'll go even further. I'll go uh, 47%, right? Of course I can play it, it's gonna stutter. It hasn't analyzed anything, it hasn't rendered frame blending or anything like that. So I'm going slow motion here, right? 47, 47%, go back to the little speed guy here. We got three qualities, we got normal, which means sucky. Frame blending, which is what we're used to as high quality, which actually was pretty good in most cases, or optical flow. Optical flow. Analyzing for optical flow. This is going to take a minute, so there's two things happening now. So now I'm doing transcoding and analysis. It first has to analyze the clip. It analyzes the direction of the basic pixel flow, and it's actually able to go and morph and make new frames where there were none. We're going to come back to it, and like a good cooking show, it should be rendered. It is miraculous. Now, uh, just to screw that up a little bit, though, before I, I walk away, is you have a bunch of speed ramping. So if I, in this situation, for, I can say to zero, which means slow down, or from zero. Um, if we were still making episodes of Cribs, we would use the instant replay or the rewind feature. So you say rewind, 2x, 4x, so wherever you put it, it rewinds all the way back and then goes back to normal. So it put that one guy at MTV out of business, and then of course instant replay. So there's some basic presets in there. All right, now, uh, anyone in the room use Pluralize? Right. Eh, nice, you don't have to anymore. Final Cut 10 has it built in, and it has two different purposes. So uh, we're taking A4, right? Let me bring this window bigger again. So we're taking camera A4, one of our interns sitting on a couch reading a magazine. Right, I have skim turned off, by the way, right? So, and then here's B4. Two different angles. I'll turn skim back on for now. You may have to, oop, my bad. And I'll turn audio skim off. Right, okay, here we are, blank timeline. So I'll take A4 and B4, right click, synchronize clips. It makes a brand new clip that is a compound clip. I'll double click it. It automatically went, took the waveform that was from the camera, automatically lined them up, there it is. So when you ask Apple where multicam is now, they'll tell you to Use the synchronized technique. Here I added a blade in two places. In this particular case, I can lift it. And so, boom, there it goes. Then it cuts to the other camera, and there he is. So automatic synchronization. The same thing goes for if you did on a Zoom recorder in 5D Mark II. You take the waveform, you take the video file, you, right, you select both of them, you right-click, say synchronize, it automatically does the synchronization. You can cut off the excess stuff that's not necessary, and it's a compound clip, and it acts completely like normal from there on. So there's automatic synchronization. I don't know, I think that's actually pretty neat stuff. So first and foremost, here's a really cool thing I didn't show. There is a text-based version of your timeline that is in sync with the playhead. As you play through, both playheads, the one on the left and the one on the right, move simultaneously together. The benefit here, all right, here we have a search. This is search for the timeline. As powerful as the search for the browser window, here we're viewing by clips. We could be viewing by tags, keywords, smart collections, and markers showing up, right? Also, you can set to-do markers. When you check them, they turn green. This is the producer's best feature ever. Hey, man, I'm going to set a bunch of markers across. When I come in tomorrow morning, they should all be green, right? So you can go through and check them off. We'll view back by clips, right? Along the bottom, there's other filters. Everything, just video, just audio, or just titles from the actual project itself. You view all, I can easily jump to the end, or search if a clip has been used, jump to the compound clip at the end. Jump back to the beginning. I don't know, I think that's actually pretty cool. That's really kind of thinking about the two different ways that we actually go and view a project file. So what happens if I want to branch off my project? Well, they tell you to duplicate the project in the project area, that's not good enough. The fact of the matter is, this is what's bad and good about Apple. In OS 10.7, there's a feature called revisions. It's like time machine for an individual document. So here's a document I'm working on. I hit revisions. There's a whole stack of documents next to it. They're both live. I can cut, copy, and paste between them. I'm only hoping Final Cut Pro is that good. But that's your autosave vault. It's built into the operating system, not into the application. Both are made by Apple. It's a bit more powerful in that way. So from effects, uh, I'm able to just touch aged film over here and scrub it. Or uh, here, I'll do something so the people in the back can see it. And I'm scrubbing it, but I can just hit play. I haven't applied it. This is H.264 footage. The filter is applied completely in real time. Here, I'll go to looks, right? We'll do uh, some bleach bypass, because the over uh, overused blue-green transfer technique went out like 10 years ago. But uh, so I'm able to just scrub across it and see it. Here's one that's cold steel. So there's the original. 
right? Here's the original. Goes green. That's a feature, not a bug. So there's the original, right? I'll go back to this guy. He's got a nice red shirt. You can see it. And then I go to Bleach Bypass, and you can just play it, and it automatically shows you what the sucker looks like. I think that's pretty powerful. I don't know about you guys. Same thing actually goes for uh, audio. The cool thing here is that audio units plus the stuff from Logic plug directly into Final Cut. I'm going to go back and find a piece of audio just for a second because this is some pretty badass stuff. So if I go to some audio, so here I'm getting uh, properties for a, a clip of audio that I've highlighted in the left hand side. So pan mode, I'm going to say pan mode, I want to uh, create a space. Come on, don't fail me now. There we go. I'm going to say circle. Now, this, did I set this project up as surround sound? Give me one second. Surround panner. Come on. I think I'm going to have to restart the app in a second. OK, check this out. Can you everyone see this OK? So because you can set 5.1 in the timeline, you can go up as high as 7.1, but it mixes down to 5.1. This is the listener. I can choose which piece of audio pans to what tracks in surround sound. It's built into Final Cut. That is not for skateboarders. So, you know, uh, effects, gunshots, panning, all this stuff is ob obviously keyframable. We're going to talk about keyframes in just a second. But you've got all of, the, all of the logic filters plug in, and they actually keep their original logic interface. So they actually have a unique interface. And they can be previewed exactly the same way. You scrub across them, hit play without having to apply them, and they automatically work. Give me one sec. Here we go, here we go. So here's the audio. And I'll use uh, something like modulation, something that we can actually hear in the back. So the preview is basically touch the filter that you want, hit play, and the actual stuff rolls. If I were to apply it the same way we used to, right, by dragging it on there, I can touch its little icon, and it opens up the actual controls that you would have gotten out of Logic. So audio filtering, a bit more powerful than it was before. All of the live preview um, works just fine. Ah, we were going to do co selective color correction replacement. Let's do his shoulder. Now we're back to normal speed. Going back to the color board, here's what's different about color. So here, I've got two tools. And you can keep stacking color corrections, primary, secondary, tertiary, as needed. So here's the eyedropper, right? Grab the eyedropper, go over to this guy, right? Do the, that kind of range selection to just grab his shirt, right? We've seen this before. But I click on the little arrow, and now I'm in the color board. So here I can, you know, it's more like a puce. It's what we're showing for the summer. Uh, here, I'll go, to, I'll go to sat instead. Right, bring him down. He's, he's illegally colored. Everyone's seeing this actually happen, right? That's H.264 footage. Not a bad selection tool for H.264 footage. You hit play, and it actually plays. The same thing goes, let's find a face. Let's find a face. That's a face. So here, I can go back to the color board. Whoops, I meant to show the color board. And I'm going to go to uh, the vignette. Click the video clip. I'm going to go back here. Um, I'm going to grab uh, the vignette. The cool thing here is I can square off the vignette. I can control the fall off of it. And of course, I'd use the normal keyframing tools to track it. Same thing goes. So on this shape mask, so right here, on a shape mask, I'm going to hit the next button. And I actually can control just that area. So I can do the feathering, and you can do, um, I wouldn't really call it bezier. That's for a third party to do. But now you at least have a vignette tool with so fall off. That's just not a circle or a square. It's actually pretty nice. And you can control, control direction of fall off if that actually had been the case. So the thing is, you can just keep stacking corrections on top of each other. Plus, plus, plus. Correction two, three, four. Your transform is here, spati spatial conform. You got stills in a widescreen timeline, hit spatial conform, two different automatic ways of having that still automatically fill the aspect ratio. iPhoto libraries, even network-based iPhoto libraries, all show up inside of the application. In a facility like ours, on a shared network volume, we're going to have iPhoto libraries. Each job is an album, and people can put all their stills inside of there. It's a pretty nice way of doing it. Same thing goes for iTunes, even from network, where we've done network shares of an iTunes library. You can't destroy it, so everyone can share it. And then, of course, you've got your transitions. Some of them are com completely wacky. Um, they're all pretty powerful. They all use um, OpenCL, so they're all super fast. They're all previews super fast. But I'm going to go to generators. Yeah, placeholder. This is actually pretty neat. Maybe it's stupid. I think it's pretty neat. 
So I'm putting this placeholder in there. I'm going to do replace edit with this gap that I left. So there's a placeholder, right? There's a lovely lady on a hill, but I'm doing something that's, uh, I need a medium shot. Fine. No, 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 no. I, I actually, I'm going to need a long shot here. I'm going to need it to have four people in it. Um, they can be men and women. It's a party. I have one for everybody. It's a sunny, it's a cloudy day. And uh, let's see, it's not pastoral, it is, uh, we're urban. <laughs> now, nah, freak it, it's an interior. So, I mean, you can start to even, someone could be like, here's what I'm looking for, and rough out the whole, who's going to make the first feature that only uses placeholders and narration? That's my question. <laughs> someone got to go home tonight and do it, right? Output. Output. Share. The nice big share window. Media browser. Media browser is the tabs that show up in every application that's Apple based, right? And video, uh, pardon me, yeah, video, or which is really within iMovie or, I, or uh, iPhoto, pardon me. Apple devices, presets for all the devices, DVD and Blu ray from the timeline. And there's some interesting options. That's the same as Final Cut Pro 7. These are the same as Final Cut Pro 7. YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, CNN, iReport, that's new, right? With an eye towards the future of distribution. Export movie and export audio are exactly the way that they used to be. Export image sequence, send to compressor, or export using compressor settings already on here. I don't know why you would do that because it ties up. This is one thing that is modal. It ties up Final Cut Pro. So you would send to compressor and let it run in the background using a different set of cores. Uh, but the cool thing is when you do go to export a movie, which I had mentioned before, this is live. I mean, you can scrub it right here. The live preview thing is pervasive. So you get access to all the codecs installed. When you install Final Cut Pro 10, go run software update. Three major packages come down. One of them is a whole new set of codecs that don't ship with the product, but immediately come down via software update. Uh, the one other thing I wanted to show, since we're all here, let's talk about moving the project. Move the project only, right? It'll reference the media wherever you move it. Move project and reference the events. I don't have a destination chosen, so it'll go ahead and do that. There is the ability to omit footage that was not used, right? Like trimming handles. So most of the stuff that was there before is there again. Markers work exactly the same, if not better, than they did before. In my opinion, when we talk about a professional editing system, in our environment, it's missing three things. It's missing the ability to drive my Kona card to OLED and CRT and flat monitors that I need in my facility. I need three monitors, not two. It's being worked on. There is a beta version of the Kona driver that is beta, which means they're working on it. XML. I don't care about opening Final Cut Pro 7 projects inside of here. I do care about how long Final Cut Pro 7 is a business that's been running on it for 10 years, the accessibility of it, and it running on my systems as we move to 10.7 and beyond, because I'm running a business. So clients will, nothing is ever done. They always want to come back in. Final Cut 7 and Final Cut 10 are in harmony. They can't be open at the same time, but they operate on the same system. Of course, everyone's going to recommend partitioning, and I understand it, but as of right now, it's been engineered, so both run on the same machine so that you can actually get into the transition. For me, mixing, missing XML means that if I start in here, I can't get at a data level into color, into DaVinci, into whatever I want to do. As for not being able to open Final Cut Pro 7 projects, there are certain editing mechanics that don't even exist in this program that existed in Final Cut 7. So they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. If it opens it and does a shitty job, we tell them they did a shitty job. If they don't do it at all, we tell them they didn't do it at all. So let them publish the XML and let a guy like Westplate or somebody else write some kind of exception-laden, crazy warning version of opening a Final Cut Pro 7 project in Final Cut Pro 10. Of course, our friends from Adobe who make great products think they're going to eat Apple's lunch temporarily because you can open Final Cut 7 projects in Premiere. And for people who are doing a ton of After Effects and Photoshop and Illustrator, use Premiere. It's fantastic. The round tripping is like the Apple environment. But the editing is not like this. It's still old hat. It's still two windows. Does anyone feel any better about this now? That's fucking awesome. <laughs>